This video was created to synthesize the research and interview material compiled as part of the final project for EDU 587 at Georgetown College. In this video, I hope to communicate three things. First, I'd like to teach you a little bit about Guatemala and Guatemalan culture. Second, I'd like to introduce you to a Guatemalan family. And finally, I'd like to give suggestions for improving the state of culturally responsive instruction in America's classrooms. First, I'll start with some geography. Guatemala is known as the land of the trees, and it's located in Central America. The climate is warm and wet, and there are 32 volcanoes. The country is very mountainous and heavily forested, and it's slightly smaller than the state of Tennessee. There are three main groups of people residing in Guatemala. The indigena, or Mayan people, the Ladino people, who are from Spanish or Mayan descent but identify culturally with the Spanish, or the Garifuna people, who are an African American group living near the Caribbean coast. I find it helpful to think about the history of Guatemala as being divided into three main parts. The Mayan Empire, Spanish rule, and then after the long civil war, the Re democratic republic that exists today. The official language of Guatemala is Spanish, and it's used also as the lingua franca between the Ladino people and the uh, indigenous population. There are 22 different indigenous languages spoken throughout the country, and there are several words and phrases that are unique to Guatemala. For example, the word va is short for verdad and is used when a Guatemalan wants to say yes or to confirm something. Housing in Guatemala is different depending on if you're in an urban location or a more rural setting. However, most homes have a central open air courtyard type area with rooms like the bedrooms and living rooms coming off that centralized space. Homes in more urban locations are built of cement or cinder block and have tile floors, whereas the rural homes are built of adobe and often have dirt floors. However, most Guatemalans, regardless of location or economic status, decorate in kind of a hodgepodge style. They're very eclectic and they kind of operate under the principle, if they like it, they hang it up. They're not so worried about things matching. Within the home, there are well-established gender roles between the male and female sexes. Uh, women perform more of the domestic chores and child care, whereas men serve as the head of the household and are responsible for the agricultural tasks and some of the business-related components, like working outside of the home. Guatemalans farm as a source of income, and popular things that are farmed are corn, fruit, and coffee. Because corn is such a significant crop in Guatemala, it's also a staple in the Guatemalan diet. They often eat corn tortillas and beans at almost every meal. Other dishes that are popular are tamales, empanadas, and then guacamole. Ironically, or interestingly enough, Guatemalans love Chinese food. The majority of Guatemalans practice the Catholic faith, although many of the Catholic traditions are often combined with Mayan rituals. Protestant religions are also common, as are some of the Mayan religions. However, almost all Guatemalans believe um, in God's will, and they often use if God wills it or only God knows in conversation. Um, they don't believe that they have much say or little, they have little control over what will go on in the future, so they leave it in God's hands. Guatemalans uh, have a, a very strong etiquette system and they value manners and respect, and so those rituals are important. When greeting someone in Guatemala, a handshake or a hug with kisses on the cheek would be popular. Uh, Mayan children often bow and fold their hands as if in prayer when greeting elders. Making small talk is really important, especially in social settings, um, as is greeting each member of a large group by name. Some taboos in Guatemala are speaking loudly in public, making the fig gesture, which is where you make a fist with your hand and stick your thumb between your pointer and middle finger, and then discussing sex is also considered taboo. Now on to the educational system in the country. The Constitution outlines a free and public education for all children ages 3 to 5. However, students only attend school typically for about 4 years with just over 8% going on to attend a university. There are major discrepancies between schools in urban and rural areas. 
but most schools lack a qualified teacher. A high school diploma is all that is needed to actually earn a certificate in Guatemala. There are lots of underqualified teachers. Villages in rural areas typically hire teachers from larger, more urban towns, but these teachers are often difficult to retain just due to the remote location of the schools. Classrooms are lacking in space, materials, and the resources that are necessary for teaching and learning. There are a set of curriculum standards, however, most children have trouble meeting these standards simply just because of the substandard teachers and lack of resources in the classroom. Cultural factors also impact schooling in Guatemala. For example, instruction is conducted in Spanish, so some of the Mayan people who do not speak Spanish struggle in that realm. Um, females also, especially Mayan females, have less educational or fewer educational opportunities simply due to the fact that they are often charged with taking care of the home and younger children. As I mentioned before, Guatemalan attitude towards misfortune and God's will also plays a role in education. They often don't believe that they have the capability of impacting their socioeconomic status because it's in God's hands. So that also plays a role in the, in the education system. I'd now like to introduce you to a Guatemalan family currently living in Kentucky. There are five members of the family and they're immigrants from San, Mar San Marcos, Guatemala. They came to Kentucky for educational and job opportunities. All five members speak Spanish with the father and the two eldest daughters being bilingual and English is their second language. The family lives in a single wide trailer in a trailer um, or mobile home park. When I arrived at the house, I immediately noticed that the yard was full of toys and random odds and ends like an exercise bike, an old cabinet, shoes, bottle caps. As I entered the living space, um, I noticed that it was large and I immediately latched onto that hodgepodge style like I described earlier. There were lots of religious items like paintings of the Last Supper, a statue of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, I noticed tons of potted plants, lots of little figurines and trinkets, family photos. It was rather warm in the house, um, but they did have a window AC unit, and it smelled a really pleasant, kind of sweet and spicy smell. Some behaviors that I thought were worth mentioning in the video were the children were really engaged in their homework throughout the interview. They felt comfortable asking myself er, for help. They also felt comfortable asking the interpreter for help. They joined in the discussion if they felt like they had, some, had something to add, so that was, that was neat to see. The mother was very free to share. She did seem anxious at times, but she smiled throughout the interview. When the father arrived home uh, mid-interview, he was greeted with lots of hugs and kisses, and you could just tell that he was a great guy. He was very jovial, cracking jokes, telling stories the whole time I was there, so that was a neat experience. Through the interview, I learned a little bit about the family's home in Guatemala. Uh, they lived in a one-room home close to relatives. Near their home, they farmed corn and peaches. And different from what I had found in the research, the males and females of the Ortiz family did not really have well-established gender roles. They all contributed equally in aspects of child care and farming. The family was very poor and couldn't afford um, new clothing or shoes, many toys. For fun, they liked to play soccer and games that didn't need toys like hide-and-go-seek. The school experience was very sad to hear about. Um, it was a two-and-a-half-hour walk each way to school, and the eldest daughter, Karina, only attended from ages 8 to 10. While the education was free, she was unable to attend um, many days just due to the long walk, it, they didn't feel it was worth it someday just because of the quality of the teacher and the materials. And then the family needed her help on the farm at other times. When discussing dreams and goals with the family, um, the mother and father both were very adamant that they wanted their daughters to keep studying. They really valued education. Due to the family's legal status, they, they also really, really harped on staying together and remaining united as a family. They're really worried about um, their future and if they will get forced to move back to Guatemala. And so they're continuously saving money to kind of facilitate that move if need be and also to possibly um, buy a, a house in Guatemala near a more urban area. 
During the interview, I learned about some typical Guatemalan gestures that the family uses. Um, my favorite gesture was they use them. Um, when they talk about the size of a collection of objects, they almost like hug the air as if they're holding a basket or a bushel of corn. And so I thought that was kind of neat. Some taboos that the family mentioned, which were different from the ones I found through the research, were how important it is to greet parents and elders, especially in the morning upon, excuse that, especially in the morning upon waking up, and then also walking in front of others engaged in a conversation is considered extremely rude. Now on to the implications and what this means for public education in the United States. First, I think it is so important to as teachers to consider the prior schooling experiences of our students that are coming into our classroom. We must explicitly teach various procedures because these students need help learning how to function in the American classroom. Also, I think it's important to consider how important listening and speaking skills are to helping develop reading abilities, and so we need to spend time in conversation with our students and encouraging good listening habits. Finally, we should help students acquire the language by encouraging them to use cognates. For example, like the one I have on the screen, um, a lot of times Spanish and English words look very similar. Finally, it's really important to remember that that interpersonal or commutative language comes much quicker, much sooner than the academic language, and so we need to give our students time. To help foster culturally responsive instruction, I think that teachers need to build background knowledge on the different cultures represented in their school. And so I've listed some resources where teachers can go to seek information from that. It's also important to make families feel welcome by inviting them to events and making sure materials are translated um, into their native language and that interpreters are provided at these events to facilitate the conversation. Finally, I think teachers must reference and utilize the different frameworks um, like the can-do descriptors, English language proficiency standards, the amplified standards, and the technology standards when making instructional decisions for their students. Thank you for watching my video and I hope you learned a little bit more about Guatemala and culturally responsive instruction in America.